with some of our chiefs of police around the state, as well as talking uh, with some law enforcement officers, rank and file, uh, who are out there uh, every single day. One of the concerns uh, that I hear from law enforcement is morale, uh, low morale, and a real concern expressed by the chiefs, but also by officers who are out there every single day about more officers retiring, uh, and fewer people who are coming forward to serve. Um, I've talked with officers, frankly, whose commitment to law enforcement goes back generations, uh, third, third generation sometimes. Uh, but some of them are telling their own kids, you know, don't get into law enforcement. Uh, one chief told me that they recently offered the civil service test, and although they typically have around uh, 200 candidates, this year they had a mere 37. Uh, the inability of law enforcement agencies uh, to recruit and retain qualified and professional officers, if this trend line continues, uh, it certainly is, is, not, is not good. Um, failure to keep the ranks of our law enforcement agencies full uh, has the potential to create a public safety crisis uh, in this state. During this time where we are seeing uh, more violence, uh, that is an additional, 
additional challenge, an additional problem. In June of last year, uh, we created the Ohio Office of Law Enforcement Recruitment to help local agencies address uh, these very issues and to assist them in recruiting uh, good candidates qualified for the job, uh, particularly uh, minorities. Sarah Shendi, the director of that office, uh, will talk in just a few more minutes uh, about the immediate efforts that the office is undertaking to help law enforcement with recruitment and to help law enforcement with retention. But first, I'd like to announce a new long-term project we're launching. Uh, the program, the project, is to recruit law enforcement candidates and to equip them with the skills they need for a successful career before they ever put on a badge. The Office of Law Enforcement Recruitment's new College to Law Enforcement Pathway Program, College to Law Enforcement Pathway Program, will connect criminal justice programs at colleges and universities in Ohio with law enforcement agencies across the state to mold our next generation of law enforcement leaders. By linking criminal justice majors with seasoned law enforcement mentors during their the students' junior and senior year in college uh, will really, I think, go a long, long way. Uh, it will give uh, these majors some real-world experience. Uh, it will be similar to a – it is, in fact, a, a mentoring uh, program. Uh, you could even refer to it as a, as a, a co-op where they'll actually go out and be with these law enforcement, law enforcement mentors. This will, they will be guaranteed as part of the program, uh, a job uh, as soon as they graduate. A couple of weeks ago, I had the chance to discuss uh, this entry level leadership development program with a group of chiefs and mayors. Uh, they were very excited uh, about the prospect of this. We're going to start uh, with a pilot project that will involve Cedarville University and Central State University. We're grateful to have representatives from participating law enforcement agencies here today, as well as several members of the Office of Law Enforcement Recruitment's working group that worked to develop this program. We also have representatives from both universities here, uh, including Dr. Virginia Redman from Central State, and Dr. Patrick Oliver from Cedarville University. Let me also mention uh, Dr. Oliver has been a consultant to our office uh, for some time, a consultant to our recruitment office, uh, and he will give more details about this pilot project. So let me first turn uh, to Dr. Oliver. The College of Law Enforcement Academic program's goal is to create a pool of highly qualified college graduates that include minorities and women for participating law enforcement agencies in the state of Ohio. The Office of Law Enforcement Recruitment wanted to reimagine how to identify, select, and develop entry-level law enforcement leaders. We decided to focus on college students because there is research evidence to support several advantages to hiring college graduates. The following are most, among the most significant advantages. The positive relationship between college education and job performance, supervisory ratings and promotion. College education does not have an adverse impact on the recruitment or retention of minority candidates. College education enhances critical thinking skills. College education develops the ability to relate to the community effectively, and college education enhances one ability to be a leader. The College of Law Enforcement Academic Program represents just one method to improve the recruitment, selection, and retention of law enforcement officers in the state of Ohio. This program does not prevent law enforcement agencies involved in the pilot study from hiring the majority of their officers using the current hiring process. It simply provides another opportunity for access to suitable quality law enforcement candidates. No person within or outside law enforcement profession can predict with complete accuracy 
the challenges law enforcement will face even five years from now. However, if the profession hires quality people, they will be prepared to meet those challenges while providing service with integrity. The quality of law enforcement service in the community will always be equal to the quality of law enforcement officers that serve that community. No amount of organizational skill or equipment can replace the human relations skills of the individual officer. The hiring of a law enforcement officer is the single most important function of any law enforcement agency. It is the mission of the Office of Law Enforcement Recruitment to assist Ohio law enforcement agencies with this most important task. Here's a list of uh, well, law enforcement agencies who made a soft commitment to the College to Law Enforcement Academic Program. It's not official commitment because all of these agencies have been asked to make a rule change to be able to hire graduates this program. Um, the following agencies have agreed to be a part of this program as long as they are, can make the rule change. And I don't know if Governor, you wanted to mention those. Um, I'll let the governor mention those agencies, but those agencies are, uh, most of them are present here. And uh, many of the leaders of those agencies are present here today. And so um, also present uh, once again are Dr. Virginia Redmond, Dr. Brad Buckmeyer from Central State University, and Dr. Mark Smith uh, from Cedarville University. So, Governor, I'll let you mention those agencies. Thank you. Doctor, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Oliver, let me just say, uh, has advised us for some time. Uh, he is a, a true expert in the area of minority recruitment, uh, and he is uh, written a number of articles um, in regard to this and is a real, as I said, a real expert. Uh, we now have 11 agencies uh, that have expressed a, a desire to be part of this. Uh, those, these are Franklin County Sheriff's Office, uh, the Xenia Police Department, the Beaver Creek Police Department, Westchester Police Department, Lancaster Police Department, Lebanon Police Department, uh, the Dublin Police Department, Fairfield Township Police Department, Fairview Park Police Department, the Ohio State Highway Patrol, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, uh, Division of Parks and Watercraft, and the Reynoldsburg Police Department. Uh, here to talk about the involvement uh, of the Franklin County Sheriff's Office is David Masterson, the Sheriff's Director of Administrative Services. David, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Dave Masterson, the Director of Administrative Services for the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. Uh, part of my role is uh, oversight of our human resources. Uh, the Sheriff's Office is committed to developing and implementing the best recruitment and hiring practices available in order to serve every resident of Franklin County. Uh, we're always looking for avenues that afford us the opportunity to engage more candidates as potential employees with our office. And on behalf of Sheriff Dallas Baldwin, we're pleased to be accepted as a partnering agency for the College to Law Enforcement Program pilot project. Um, we believe that our experience and expertise can be mutually beneficial as the program continues to grow. And one of the main things that drew us to this project is uh, we love the fact that while we continue our traditional hiring processes, uh, we know that this particular process with the two uh, partnerships with the two universities is ongoing in the background. And at the end of it, we're going to have viable vetted candidates that we can offer employment to. Uh, great. Thank you very much. Yep. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so again, this is a, a long-term program that helps criminal justice majors uh, develop uh, their skills. And it does it. Uh, in, the, in the combination of the academic uh, as well as actually being out with officers. Uh, we also know there's an urgent need for qualified candidates right now. Uh, I'm going to now ask uh, Sarah Shendi and talk about some of the other initiatives that we've been working on to help law enforcement agencies recruit qualified uh, officers. Sarah. Governor DeWine, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to just talk about a few of some of the short-term things that the Office of Law Enforcement Recruitment is doing on a daily basis. I would like to say Monday through Friday, but I'm gonna extend it to Monday through Sunday um, to help 
uh, police departments find and attract those qualified applicants. Uh, first thing that I want to mention is we have monthly newsletters and they do address topics under the umbrella of the selection, retention and recruitment of law enforcement officers. Um, Governor DeWine announced a couple weeks ago our upcoming grant program that's going to be available to help out these departments. Um, our website is up and running. If you have not checked that out, please do. It has a lot of good and uh, valuable information for those who are interested in entering the law enforcement profession. Um, Dr. Oliver and I have been uh, speaking at conferences. Um, uh, we have also the Attorney General's Conference coming up in October. And yesterday I spoke at the School Resource Officer Conference on, on how police officers in schools also impact recruitment in the state of Ohio. Um, twice a month we hold educational webinars, again, covering the same three topics, selection, retention, and recruitment of police officers. And uh, those webinars are free and they have been very well attended. And uh, we, we are promoting the Grow Your Own program, which Dr. Oliver talks about in one of his books. Um, to target more minorities and women, we have uh, a couple of women empowerment panels um, that are scheduled to go out on webinar as well. And those usually involve uh, Q&A to talk to women that are in supervisory positions in law enforcement. Uh, we also do one-on-one -on -one with police departments in terms of if they need help with their recruitment strategies, we do one-on-one -on -one with colleges. Um, the two colleges that I have worked with the most have been Kent State University and the University of Akron. And um, I've also done engagements virtually and in person with open enrollment academies. Um, the last two things are gonna, that I'm gonna mention are um, my efforts with speaking to youth police academies um, around the state of Ohio. And I think the most valuable thing and, and my favorite thing to do is the one-on-one uh, -on -one guidance and mentorship to cadets and our potential recruits that want to come into law enforcement. Thank you, Governor. Great. Thank you very, very much. We continue uh, to work with the state legislature. This is budget season, uh, and there are a number of initiatives that were in our proposed budget uh, and that we hope uh, will be included in the final budget passed by the state legislature. Um, one of these is to direct more funding to the Ohio Law Enforcement Recruitment Office. Uh, the funding would create a new grant program to fund innovative ideas at the local level to recruit female and minority officers. Things like law enforcement, also like law enforcement academy scholarships, um, law enforcement explorer posts, police athletic leagues, K-12 through mentoring programs. All of these things play a role uh, in ultimately in recruitment. Uh, the earlier you can reach a young person, get them interested in law enforcement or in any profession, uh, the better chance there is that that person will end up uh, in that profession. We're also working hard through the budget to give our officers the tools they need to help reduce violent crime in our communities. We continue to hear from law enforcement officers uh, that it's a small number of the criminal element that causes most of the violent crime. We also have data that clearly, clearly shows this. The budget uh, that the legislature is working on right now, uh, we hope will include funding for violent crime reduction grants that can be used by agencies to implement new violent reduction strategies, such as gunshot detection technology, uh, expansion of safe streets task forces, and other uh, innovative local violent crime reduction initiatives. We also plan to support our local law enforcement agencies through the new budget by expanding our our Ohio School Safety Center, uh, as well as the Ohio Narcotics Intelligence Center, or as we call it, ONEC. Uh, by expanding the ONEC, we'll also be able to increase analysts' investigative capacity to assist law enforcement in cases where violent crime is linked to narcotics trafficking, as it is many times. We also intend to expand the ONEC's capabilities so that we can provide that level of service all across the state of Ohio to every law enforcement agency. Uh, our job is to help and support Ohio's local law enforcement with the resources and the assistance that they need. Um, and what we're announcing today, we believe will be of significant, significant help. Uh, now happy to take any questions.
Well, it's probably better coming from uh, someone who's in law enforcement. I don't know if anyone wants to take take on that question. You want to take it? Um, you might you might tell them about your you, sure. sir. Tell them about your law enforcement background, though. Sure. Um, I've been with the Copley Police Department since 2008, and I say this phrase almost every single day. This is the best job on the planet. It is the most fulfilling. Um, a lot of people think about leaving behind a legacy. As a police officer, you get to see your legacy within your community and within the kids that you interact with. So I do understand that this is a very rough time for law enforcement, but that's when leaders rise. And um, as I mentioned in the SRO conference yesterday, every single police officer in uniform is a leader because every single time we're out in the community, we do have the potential of impacting lives and changing lives. And although there are many professions in, in this great, great country of ours where lives are changed and saved every day from teachers to doctors. No one does it under the conditions in which law enforcement operates every single day, 365 days a year, 24 seven, we're out there making sure everybody is safe. So an incentive would be the fact that it's the best and most honorable profession on the planet. And you, you don't question if you're making a difference in someone's life, you know, you go to bed knowing that you made you made a difference in someone's life. You may have saved someone's life that day, and that's unbeatable. So to me, that's a big enough incentive. Everything else is a plus. Thanks. Thank you. Who else? Anyone? Uh, the Supreme Court decision just came out. Uh, I've not had a chance to read it. I just saw the headline, which is basically what you said. So I don't have any additional comment until I have, have a chance to actually look at the Supreme Court decision. I don't know if anyone else has a comment. Yeah, let me, let, let me ask. I'll take that, doctor. We tend to have, we will have workshops for all of the candidates accepted into the program. So we'll be touching on contemporary law enforcement issues and preventing bias-based policing will absolutely be one of them. So yes. Well, Central State University has about 200 students. Cedarville University has about 50 students that are criminal justice majors. It's for traditional criminal justice majors only. And it's a pretty rigorous qualification process. So uh, we'll take as many students that can get through the process. There's an academic, there's an academic, you might, you might talk to them a little bit, doctor, about maybe some of the qualifications they have to fit. Uh, the pre-qualifications is they have to have a 3.0 grade point average. They have to meet our attendance requirements. They have to be students of high moral character. We have six core values. Uh, they are going to be interviewed by faculty at each of the universities. Those are the pre-qualifications. If they meet those, then they can apply to the program. Once they apply to the program, they're gonna get a personal history questionnaire followed by a full complete background investigation, followed by a polygraph, physical fitness testing, psychological, medical. Uh, they'll have to take a career assessment. So it's gonna be a very extensive, rigorous process to get in this program. I think it'll probably have a fairly high elimination rate but we are raising standards, not lowering standards. We want to get the very best college students to be in this program so that they can be hired by the agencies represented here today. The parallel is as you described it. That's correct. There's some additional things that they don't do, but that parallel is correct. This has never been done before. And so we're gonna try something that's new and that's different, and we're very excited about it. So we're gonna take college students the very best and prepare them for a career in law enforcement. Uh, I don't know what the stats say on that, but certainly I would suspect that law enforcement of the three areas of concentration, law enforcement, courts, and corrections, seems to be the more, most dominant focus of college students who major in criminal justice.
Well, this is really an honors academic program. We're going to take the very best students. We're going to mentor them. We're going to train them. We're going to develop them. And they'll be virtually guaranteed a job when they graduate. So it's a special opportunity for them. It's an entry level law enforcement program. So they'll go into uh, being a police officer. They could end up on Ohio State High Patrol. They could end up with the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. They could end up with Reynoldsburg PD, Fairview Park PD, any of the law enforcement agencies represented here in Ohio today. Because all those agencies are participants. I think this is consistent with what uh, we're doing more and more of uh, every day, and that is to try to link education to the real world. I uh, had the opportunity to speak yesterday to the new president of Ohio University. I've talked to several other presidents recently uh, uh, of our colleges and universities about this, and they are looking more and more uh to linking their students while they're still in college with businesses uh and getting these young people into internships getting them into into situations where they are actually working uh in that prof different profession or that particular business um, i think there's no substitute if you want to know whether a profession <laughs> is what you really want to go into uh, being immersed in it is, is, is an excellent way of, of doing that. And I think, again, this is, there's a real trend line, uh, even from, from high school, college, uh, with all kinds of different professions, to try to get them, the students actually out uh, with that profession or with that particular business. And so I think this is consistent with, with what we are doing in other areas as well. Well, that's a, it's a multiple questions. Um, look, we've been able to do many things. I'm going to let Patrick uh, talk about for a moment uh, after I do. But uh, we also have a bill pending in the legislature, as you know. Uh, and that bill is focused on police reform. Uh, it, is, it is focused on uh, treating law enforcement as the profession that, that it truly is. So once the budget is done and the legislature comes back in the, in the fall, uh, I'm hopeful uh, that they will focus on, on that bill uh, because this is a bill that uh, I think has real bipartisan support. I think it has uh, support uh, from communities. I think it also has support from law enforcement. So uh, that reform bill is still pending in, in, in the legislature. So Patrick, I don't know if you wanna add anything else. Sarah, you can. Uh, um, I also wanted to add, in addition to what was said, that as a law, as a law enforcement profession, we can't wait on bills. We can't wait on massive change. We reform every single day. We reform after every encounter that could have gone better, after every traffic stop that could have been handled differently, after every, you know, maybe a phrase was said on a domestic violence call that shouldn't have been said. We have to reform is incumbent upon us as individual officers, as departments. So all the things that are going on on a larger level are great and they absolutely help us and we do need them. But reform is a personal responsibility and it is something when, when, when we say law enforcement reform, I want you to think about we reform after every single encounter because we're human and we make mistakes and we, we have to evaluate our decision making and say, okay, next time I'm not going to do this because it didn't work well. I'm going to do things this way. So we are in charge of our reform and also each other's. Sure. So I don't think that we can ever do enough. I don't think I think this is an endless uh, goal that we will always be pursuing. But I do believe that because of all of the hard conversations that we've had across the country, especially here in the state of Ohio, some of which I've been involved with, um, we are changing hearts within our profession as well as within communities. So, yes, I do think that we have come away. Um, and again, it's an everyday thing.
carry that stigma from other officers that have made other mistakes while other law enforcement officers that are doing the job the right way every single day? Sure. And without commenting on any um, instances in specific, I will tell you that, you know, it goes without saying that the majority of officers are in this profession for the right reason. And it does feel very heavy to carry some days, but every single day we have to lead by example. We have to go out there. We have to do what's right. We have to do what's expected of us. And I have had people young and old, black and white, Muslim, Christian, Jewish say, when I see a cruiser, I feel scared. And it's, again, incumbent upon me, and it's my responsibility to change that in their mind. I have to be the change that I want to see. I'm not going to put that responsibility on anybody else. So it is a hard thing to carry. But, again, great leaders rise during the most challenging of times like we've seen in history, and that's no different than what's happening in this country today. Part, let me just add one, one thing. Part, this is not an easy time to be in law enforcement. And it, it really is incumbent upon those of us in government and the public um, to make sure that law enforcement has all the tools that they need. And by all the tools, I mean, I mean training. Uh, this particular program we're talking about uh, is a program really that's designed to develop leaders, uh, people who are going to end up with a four-year college degree, uh, people who will be able to have worked in law enforcement before they actually put on, finally put on, put on that badge. So it's, it's exciting. Uh, it is not going to solve every problem, but it's one step forward uh, that I think will make a di big difference. But we have to continue to examine, are we doing enough to provide the training and help that law enforcement needs so that every law enforcement officer can live up to their God-given potential? That's our job. Students, I think people like to be challenged. They want to do something that's very d difficult. This is going to be an elite academic honors program for students who want to be mentored. They want to have a field experience. They want to get special training. Um, so it's going to be a great opportunity for them. And so I think in knowing that they're going to be guaranteed a job when they graduate, all those things are going to be a big plus for them. So I think they'll want to be a part of this. Well, the two universities represented, Cedarville University and Central State University, have majority, minority, women. And so there's a composite of all, all the people that we're looking for in both those institutions. Well, the two big problems in law enforcement in regard to hiring and hiring, recruitment, selection, retention is a top three issue nationally. And the two issues for law enforcement agencies are, one, we can't get enough qualified candidates through the process. And two, we can't get enough qualified minorities and women through the process. So this program addresses both of those at the same time, because we're going to recruit them, select them, train them, develop them, and then have a pool of highly qualified candidates that include both minorities and women. So it's not so much increasing the pool, but it is giving law enforcement agencies access to qualified candidates. I, you know, I've not had any conversation with the president recently about that. Well, one of the reasons I went out um, and to meet with law enforcement officers in the last few weeks is to really dis discuss directly with them what they're seeing, uh, what they're hearing. Uh, you know, I've, I meet with chiefs, but I want to also, frankly, meet with rank and file officers. I met with some from the Columbus PD. I did the same thing with the Springfield PD. Um, and 
you know, it is it is a difficult time. But we have to support law enforcement. We have to make sure that they have the training they need. We have inconsistent training in the state of Ohio. Uh, we're here in, in, in Columbus. They have Columbus PD has their own academy, get great training. Uh, but we have other uh, law enforcement agencies. Uh, you know, not only don't they have their own academy, but, you know, they can't afford to have the officer go away for any period of time because there's only a few people on on the force. So we've got over 900 police departments in the state of Ohio. So, uh, you know, most of them are small. But, it, you know, if you live in a small town, if you live in a, in a village, if you live in a township, you, you deserve to have the same policing uh, as somebody that lives in a city. Uh, the same thing for the officer. That officer who, who works, you know, in a small village can have a domestic violence case just as easily as an officer in, in a city can. So we have to continue to, we have to work more on training. Frankly, we have to put more money in training. Uh, second, uh, we do have initiatives in this budget that it would appear, at least at this moment, I don't count things until they're done, but it would appear that both the Senate and the House support them. Uh, and so things that I, I talked about there, I think will be in the, in the final version of the budget. Uh, third, we have a bill uh, that when the legislature comes back in the fall, um, I hope that they will address. And there seems to be starting to emerge a, a consensus. Uh, and that is violent repeat offenders need to be locked up and they need to be taken out off of our streets and the, you know, we did a study uh, when i was attorney general back in 1970 back uh, you know six seven years ago now i guess um, and we went back from 1977 to the present looked at every felony case uh, every felony conviction in the state what we found is that it's exactly what police officers tell us it's a small number of the criminal element that commits all the violent crime so what do you do? We need to target those violent repeat offenders and remove them. The bill that we have will do that. It does it by saying that if you uh, commit a, a, a crime, a violent crime, um, and then you're caught again with a gun, which you know you're not supposed to have, that the, that the judge can impose a very significant sentence. That will help change things on the street. So there's not any one thing. But these are all these are three solid things that will, in fact, make a difference. What's your phone number, Michael? <laughs> About seven o'clock. So if it rings. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, let me kind of describe where uh, we are based upon uh, my conversations with, with, with experts. Um, summer looks good. Uh, we're, moving, we're moving forward. Uh, the real concern among the experts, uh, and we'll be bringing some of these experts to, to do some, some public uh, do some press conferences, but the concern is what happens in the fall and what happens in the winter. What happens when the kids go back to school? Uh, what happens when we are inside more. So those are concerns. Now, the good news is we have vaccinated a significant number of our population. We're at about, if you look at adults, we're at about 58 percent. Um, the bad news is that still leaves a lot of people who are not vaccinated. If you look at our county chart, uh, and we break this down by county, all 88 counties, and what you find is that there's some counties that are really low in vaccination rate. And so those are the areas that we worry about. There be school goes back in, people are moving around, they're inside more. We worry about outbreaks that will, that will occur. Um, we are losing, um, best we can tell, and, and deaths can, are, are lagging. So you never get the data in, in, in the right, you know, you don't get it immediately, it's, it's lagging. But I've asked our, our data people to look at this, and they told me this morning that they think we're averaging today about 14 deaths a day in Ohio from COVID. So we're not through this, is, is, is my point, Jim. Uh, we've, we've got 
we're, you know, we're a lot better off than we were. We have the vaccine, but we just have to do everything that we can to make the vaccine available uh, for any Ohioan who, who, who wants it and encourage Ohioans to, to take it. The Vaximillion was extremely successful. Uh, it was extremely successful in the first week. What it accomplished in the first week was made it a success. The second week was a good week as well. Uh, after that, we don't. We assume that there continue to be some people who are getting vaccinated because of the vaccine million, but clearly the impact went down uh, after that second week. Uh, it, but it really punched it. Uh, we were going down like that. Uh, it took us back up, and you know we've had a lot of people who've been vaccinated, either who wouldn't have gotten vaccinated uh, at all, or uh, who were vaccinated earlier uh, than they would have been. And that, that matters as well. So successful, happy with it. Um, but, you know, you're looking at the numbers today and, you know, we're, we edge up every day, but we have a, we have a ways to go. And again, I'm concerned, uh, you know, as happy as I am to have this press conference in public, as happy as I am to go to a Cincinnati Reds baseball game, as happy as I am to go out fishing with my kids and grandkids and do all the things that we're, we all like to do that I'm doing and Fran's doing, uh, you know, the concern is what happens in the fall. Kids are back in school. What happens when we get inside more and in, into the late fall and then into the winter, uh, you know, with the variants that, that are in fact out there. That is the, that is the concern. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> Anybody else? So that's something we work on every day. I mean, very little of what we do each day is shown to the public. But what we like to do is re reiterate to the officers out there that you have to make that impact every single day. So it's not your community relations bureau. Uh, it's not a specialty assignment. Each officer has to go out there every day to make an impact on the public that they serve. So we just reiterate that and make it part of our culture within our, our agency. Yeah, I think there is an opportunity for an officer each and every day to have that contact to show what we have um, tried to express today, which is that this is the most wonderful profession in the world. You get to make a difference in one person's life each and every call and each and every contact. Uh, but I think the additionally to that, as a profession, we are also trying to lean into the conversations we heard uh, for the last year, and in particular with diverse communities who feel like they are expressing for the first time angst that they have had or concern that they have had about being protected as well in their communities. And so leaning into those conversations, I think is critically important for us as a profession. And as an example, um, you know, our department has, and our city uh, created a couple of community dialogues to continue that conversation as a community task force in Dublin and as a chief's advisory committee. And we've met uh, each month with a group of, again, very diverse members of, and stakeholders in our community to have those critical conversations about policies and practices and procedure and where we're going as a profession. This is a fundamental opportunity, not for us to just meet the expectations of today, but to project forward to figure out what does policing look like in the future in the state of Ohio and in the US. And so I think leaning into those conversations, but hearing those voices who are advocating for change and progress to be seen and heard and included in those conversations is critically important because this is not a job we can do by ourselves, nor do we want to do by ourselves. We serve the community, we protect the community with the community. And so those partnerships are fundamental for us figuring out where we're going as a profession and going in public safety as communities in the state of Ohio. All right. Thanks, everybody.